Hi, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Avati here, and welcome to Church Street Studios, my Sydney studio where I record my podcast, a Serious Chat with a Comedian. Well, today, we have a bona fide rock star, ladies and gentlemen. He's been twice inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, once with Santana, once with Journey. You've heard that song, Black Magic Woman? Well, he is the voice. Currently, he's in the Ringo Starr All-Star Band. Let's go and meet him, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Greg Rowley. Well, my guest today is Mr. Greg Rowley. Greg, thanks for joining us, mate. It's been quite a while in getting here. Thanks, we are, we are finally here. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. So you're living in Austin, Texas now, right? Right. Yeah, I've been here for, I've been here for, geez. First lived in a place called Dripping Springs. I remember telling my attorney in L.A., uh, moving to Dripping Springs, Texas, it's by Austin. He goes, can I just say you're from Austin? <laughs> I didn't think much about it. It's actually, Austin is getting a really good reputation around the world for being a hip place. Why is that? Well, it's, it was built on music. It was the music capital, live mu- music capital of the world. And then uh, of recent, it was part of the reason why we moved here. My son started playing and he, we came here from California. And uh, he, he found he could go somewhere and actually play somewhere and actually make money. In California, you pay to play. The, the bars, whatever, you pay them. So daddy's got enough money, you can get your crummy band to play anywhere. And it used to be, you had to try out. When I started, you, you auditioned. And if you weren't good enough, they, they wouldn't put you in there. That's in Los Angeles. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you started. Obviously, you were very young when you and Carlos formed Santana, right? Oh, yeah. I, in Woodstock, I think it was 22. Started started yeah. with I started with Santana. I, I it was I was in college at the time. I was going to be an architect. Yeah, and I yeah that went bye bye when I got in a band. So um, yeah, I I had to be like nineteen or something when when I started out with Santana. And but it- you, you played. You played very young, though. But what, if you take us back to your childhood, just briefly, how did how did you go from there to to you getting into music first? Let's start there. Yeah, we, we were just talking about things you remember and things you don't. Well, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> I, you know, I'll, I'll just go to the quick. I there was a piano in our house all the time. My mom could play a bit. Uh, brother yeah. took it up, took lessons. The older brother. And of course, being a young kid, going well, I could do that too. And so I took some lessons. I hated it. I couldn't yeah. stand. It. I could still smell the perfume of the. Well, I was like young. I'm I don't know, eleven, ten, something like that. Yeah. And I could hear during the summer, kids outside playing baseball and stuff. I'd rather be doing that. And here I am plunking around on a piano. And the the point was that I, I never learned how to read any of it. I just learned the songs. I learned what it was. Yeah. And she goes, oh, you're reading really well. I said, yes, thank you. And I wasn't reading anything. And so that kind of kicked it off. But somebody was always coming by the house and that knew yeah. more than me and more than my brother. And I thought my brother was, he would have been better than me if he went into that, but he didn't. And uh, you're right. He, he just. Well, what did he end up doing? He, he laughs about it now. He goes, oh, no, I was way smarter than that. I got into transportation. He had a trucking outfit. <laughs> goes, yeah, right, yeah. okay. Well, yeah, there's some good money in that anyway. Well, there so, is, but it's like it's rough business. Yeah. And he, you know, and then he's watching what happened to me. He goes, yeah, oh, boy, did I make the right choice. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have done it had, had it not been sibling rivalry. I, you know, I just... And then, and then it just, it continued. And I play yeah. everything by ear, can't read it to this day. And Well, that's, that's really um, interesting because I learned to play the piano by ear as well. And I still don't know how to read. And I keep on saying, you know, one of those kind of, you know, I've got to get around to it. I've got to learn properly. 
I, I just realised I don't have to learn properly, no, do I? I, I? My whole point to all of this is that music's for your ears, not your eyes. Yeah. And so mm. if you can hear it, and you hear you wrong, yep. and then go change it. You, I, it, and it'll always sound pretty good if you if you got an. Yeah. And I, I haven't suffered from it. I ended up playing with a lot of people. And uh, well, yeah, yeah, we we'll get to that. We'll get to that a little bit later on. So, so here you are. You're you're, um, you're 19 years old. You're in college. How did you meet Carlos Santana? Um, well, there, there was a, a band that I played in, and uh, uh, ju just goofing around high school, and and then yeah. and not even into college really. But one of the guys, his name is uh, Tom Fraser. And he mm -hmm. was a singer and a guitar player, and he saw Carlos playing in San Francisco uh, on a Tuesday night yeah. at the Fillmore, yeah. where Bill Graham would allow local talent to come in and play because nobody yeah. there. It's yeah. actually kind of closed down, and so uh, he saw him playing, and he comes back to Palo Alto. It's 30 miles south of of San Francisco, and uh, where we were. And he said, I, I saw this guitar player, man, I'm, I'm going to go find him. I said, okay, go get him. Go find him. Yeah. And so he drove up and yeah. he found him and he, at working at a, it was called Tick Talks. And it's a, it was a, a hamburger place and on Columbus, Columbus right. Street in San Francisco. And he went and found him. He yeah. found it through the Fillmore, found out where he was. And he went and found him and uh, said, you want to go jam? With a guy from William Penn, which was a a, a a pretty big top 40 band in the Bay Area in San Francisco, he wanted to play with right. him with the keyboard player, and so he brought him down to to jam in Mountain View, which is now Shoreline Amphitheater, and right. and uh, we played, and then the we just jammed. I had a box organ at the time; I didn't even have a B3. And and so we jammed and uh, smoked some grass, and then the cops came, and I turned to Carlos I just met. So we got to get out of here, right? Well, I was talking to the back of his head. All I saw was his ass and elbows going the other way. And, and we ran and hid in a tomato patch till the cops left, and that's how I met him. That was the first, so that the actual first night that you met Carlos Santana, that's what actually yeah, yeah. happened. And then we, then wow. we started playing. We started, I would yeah. go, I, w I was going to school at the time and I decided uh, I mm. got to make a choice and, and plus try to get out of uh, the v Vietnam War. I didn't belong there. And yeah, so right. I, I had a college so, deferment and didn't have to. Yeah. So I got rid of that by uh, quitting school. And then I was up for the draft and all that stuff and I had to weasel my way through that or my we wouldn't be talking now if, if that had come to fruition mm. why why was santana called santana and not like a name why did you didn't you guys give it a name a generic name you know the covered well, we kind of named it after yeah. like like blues band paul butterfield blues band all the the blues bands were named after one guy santana happened to be yeah. a great name that nobody would have and uh, we sure. called it Santana Blues Band. And as the music, yeah. as the music changed, we dropped the blues band part. We weren't playing blues. Or, yeah, right. We did play a lot of blues. You know, all that yeah. music is based on blues, jazz, a, a million other things. And, uh, yeah. and with, with congas and timbales. And we did something that nobody had ever done. And you were the lead singer, right? Yeah, yeah. And this this is what uh, one of the things that fascinated me about you when we first met was, um, you know, when when Tony told me what you had done, you know, it it, it just kind of I, I was just in in awe of that. I go, oh, this is the guy that sang Black Magic Woman, right? And people I don't think really knew that. How, how did how did that sort of translate back in those days? Well, you know, we. we were you that? Were you more the keyboard player or the singer? You know. No, I was. I, I sang the stuff for, in the band right away. You know, yeah. everybody else kind of had an accent, 
or couldn't sing, you yeah. know, and so right. it was me. I heard that by Elton John, yeah. he sang because nobody else would. And yeah, I, heard, right. I, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I heard. Yeah. At any rate, that's kind of yeah. how that happened. I, I, I mean, I could sing. And you know, I had yeah. to learn more inflections of blues and more, yeah, I had to learn different things. I was brought up on Beatles and Stones and things like that. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and so when, when I got turned on to heavy blues, you know, Muddy Waters and stuff like that, I was like, my God, man. And Howlin' Wolf, yeah. Elmore James. And, and who, who was writing all the songs? Were, were you co-writing some of the songs? Yeah. I was Carlos I, I arranged a lot. I wrote a lot. Um, and, yeah. But we co-wrote the stuff. You know, when you look back yeah. at a band, you might yeah. have, uh, for instance, Black Magic Woman isn't one of ours. That, that was Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac. Mm -hmm. And the reason why yeah. uh, that ended up being what it was is Michael Shreve, the drummer, brought me that Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac album and because he knew I liked Peter Green. And, he, and mm -hmm. I ran across Black Magic Woman. I said, man, I can sing this. And that, it would shoot out. Yeah. And then it took yeah. me a year to talk the band into doing it. And, yeah. and then, we, then you couldn't get rid of it. Got the number five. Yeah. So was, was, was the Santana version of Black Magic Woman more popular than the Fleetwood Max version? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, yeah, part of my ignorance on that one, but I, I didn't know that, so yeah, I, I, I had to ask I you. loved the version that they did. It was more Otis Rush. It was really cool. Yeah. And yeah. that's what struck me. I mean, this is really cool. The chords are simple. The, mm. And we changed them. We changed the chords. Every time we played a song, that Oye Como Va belonged Tito Puente. I mean, there's a lot of songs that we, yeah. we did that were yeah. somebody else's. And it's always been the mm -hmm. case. I learned from that band, William Penn, that I don't play yeah. other people's music that well if I have to learn what they did. I just don't. Sure. And so I always have to make it my own. And, yeah. and so that's what we did. We made those songs belong to us. And you yeah. know, took the essence of them and the real, the real song, the words, the melody and everything. But the made did yeah. it the way we would. And what was it like playing Woodstock? Tell us about that. Um, Is there something you can tell us that we don't know yeah, about know, Woodstock? What did you guys get up to? <laughs> you may have heard it, but I'll say it again. It's like um, Woodstock, uh, we, we had a house in the town of Woodstock. Woodstock played mm -hmm. in White Plains. It was, yep. was not Woodstock, but it was called that. And White Plains in um, in, uh, and, uh, near uh, New York, do you mean? Yeah, White Plains, New York. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. And so we played a couple of gigs, and we had done shows. And there was a lot of uh, outside live festivals, 10,000, 20,000 people, you know. So we had done some of those. And then uh, this one was a half a million. Well... They flew us in helicopters to go play because people driving there parked on the highway. They left their cars on the highway and you couldn't get through. So we couldn't drive to it. So they had to figure out how to do it and that's what they did. We flew in and I remember yeah. um, Barry Umhoff who worked for Bill Graham Presents. He was sitting across from me in this. It's one of those Korean War helicopters where the side is that open? <laughs> and you're leaning out like that. Yeah. Right? Anyway, he goes, look at all those people. And as we flew in, and all I could think was uh, a lot of people. Looked like ants on a hill. Yeah. And, and couldn't yeah. relate. And so yeah. we landed, yeah. and, we went down, and then we were supposed to go on later in the afternoon, and they said, you're on now. And so, uh, right. so we got on and, and played. And... They had a, a turnstile, they had a great idea, it didn't work, but they had a turnstile where they could set up a band behind while one's playing and then turn it and the turnover would be quick. It was smart. 
but the, they couldn't get it to move, so it it became the same old thing. They <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that happened. And, uh, yeah. And then, and at the time that you played Woodstock, um, how big was Santana at that time? Did it get oh, any no, we, bigger than that, we were, or, or you were on the way up? We were on the way up. We we had no album. We we had recorded yep. one. But it, yeah. it, when we hit Woodstock, it, it wasn't there. Bill Graham is the guy who got us into Woodstock. And the way that happened was um, Michael Lang, who put it together. It's the young guys putting this guy. He calls up Bill. He goes, I need help with this. It's become incredibly huge. Uh, I need help. Will you help mm -hmm. me? And Bill told him, yeah, I'll help you. But you must have mm -hmm. Santana. And Wow. And, okay. Yeah, and uh, Michael told me this uh, a while back, and he must have you must have Santana. That's the way he talked. And uh, he goes, "What Santana? I'll send you a tape." So he sent him. Mm. I don't even think we had cassettes then. I, you know, he sent him a tape, and uh, yeah. he goes, "Okay, he's in, they're in," and then we got into Woodstock, and. Yeah. And Bill was signing uh, contracts and stuff for us, and he wasn't our manager. <laughs> and we were, okay, right. whatever. It was back in the day when things like that happened, and you know, now you yeah. Get, yeah. you got contracts this thick that yeah. you know that are ridiculous. But it, it's become a mm. full-fledged huge thing. And when we started, it was yeah. it was a lot simpler. And what did Woodstock do for Santana? What did it do for you guys well, then? Like, like most, um, uh, like most bands there, if you played there, you had a career. And as right. as as long as uh, you were accepted, whatever. I mean, it, it, then you had a career with it, and it, it set the whole thing off. We we were big on the West Coast. We could play the Fillmore. We could play all these places. But uh, New York hadn't heard of us, and we're playing festivals and, you know, fourth in line and uh, things like that. And got into Woodstock, got in the movie, in the middle of the movie, and and then it was history. It just, everybody, yeah. oh my God, what is this? And that's what happened when we played it live. Soul Sacrifice came on. Nobody had ever heard that kind of music, not in the East Coast. And, yeah. Yeah. and it caught and that's it. And when did um, Neil Sean join the band? Neil. Was it later? Was it after Woodstock? Oh, yeah. Neil got in uh, before the third album. We were recording a Braxis, and I used to pick up Neil from high school. Yeah. He wasn't going to high school. <laughs> he was there, but he, but he was in the... <laughs> he, was, uh, he was in the quad playing his guitar. I mean, he, yeah. That's what this guy was going to do forever. So, and yeah. it became true. So, I yes. just pick him up and we go up to while we're recording at Wally Hyder's in San Francisco and, uh, and jam with him. And he came in and jammed. And the whole point was for me, I want to get him into this band. But it would be really bad for him to go, you know, Carlos, we need another guitar player. <laughs> yes, I was about to say, yeah. Uh, yeah, Carlos, we, uh, I've got this other guitarist I want to bring in here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, how, how, did that, how did that go down with Carlos? So what happened, I know, we just, he liked his playing, so I never said a word about it because it, uh, I, it was bad for him. And, and if it mm. worked out, it would work out and things would happen. And Carlos said, what do you think about having this guy be in the band? I said, what a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got all the great yeah. ideas. So, uh, so that happened, and Neil joined the band. But at the time, Neil had a choice of playing with Eric Clapton and, uh, what was it, Derek and Domino. Or going, yeah, right. or going with Santana. So I had a meeting with his yeah. mom and dad and said, you know, if, if you do this, he's in San Francisco. They're in San Mateo. 
uh, yeah. you know, he'll be he'll be close to home. He'd come stay with me and I'll keep an eye on him. Well, that didn't work out too good. We kept an eye on each other and it was a mess. <laughs> we were young. <laughs> how, how old was Neil then? Oh, he was 15, 16 years old. Yeah, right. And, and how old were you? Uh, I don't know. He's seven years old. I was 22, I guess, 21, 22. Yeah, right. Yeah, wow. Wow. What? You know, when, when you think about it, when you think about it today, when you think of, of those ages, you know, today, in today's terms, you know, it, it just wouldn't happen, would it? It, it just wouldn't, wouldn't be, a, I don't know, would it, would, it, would it be allowed? You know, are, are there kids that good these days um, from your, from I don't from know, what you know? allowed is the word. It, I don't think the labels nowadays would allow themselves to sign up with anything that didn't have legs already. That's kind of where it's at. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. what yeah. are your numbers? What are, you know, what are, mm -hmm. uh, they, they kind of want you to do it before and get there before they do anything. Yeah. And that's the way it's been for a little bit of time, which is totally different back then. You had a chance, yeah. you know, you had, you had a chance to do three albums if you did get signed. And even even Journey had that uh, mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. But it, if it caught on, then you move on to the next thing. And I, I have been very fortunate. Everything is people like it. And uh, yeah. I've been real lucky with that. And how much truth is there to, uh, I believe, that the Chicago Tribune um, once wrote a, a review about Santana and um, they said that, you know, Carlos Santana hasn't sounded as good as this good for a long time, but it wasn't actually Carlos playing, it was Neil. Yeah. Is, there, is there any truth in yes. that? It was, uh, right. it, it was part of the end of the band. And it's like Carlos one, wanted certain guys to leave the band. He wasn't going to go on the tour. It was on the third album. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I talked to the band and said, this, this is our band. And he, yeah. so we went out and without him, we went, played a bunch of dates without him. And Neil, Neil played the solo stuff. And we played, I, I think it was in Washington, yeah. uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, somebody, go, that's not Carlos Santana. And they caused a whole riot almost. Um, and I wonder who started that because... All the, everybody was saying, I mean, Carlos sounded great on them, and Neil could play, I mean, he, he can play anything. And so, yeah. um, that's come, and, and then Neil came to me and he goes, man, I can't do this. I said, all right, so we gotta get Carlos mm -hmm. to come out here. And, and then the whole thing kind of imploded. But how does that actually work? I mean, it, it, Carlos, obviously they look very different. What he just got up there? Was it because there were just thousands of people that couldn't see? What, what? How did that? I don't understand how that would work. Just for for Carlos to say I'm not coming out, when obviously people are expecting to see well, him. Well, the point right? was is that I, it was still pretty early on, and there was a lot of people that hadn't seen the band. But we made, all right, we, okay. My point, my point about it was very simple. Yeah. We we made some contracts to go do this. I don't want to have to. Yeah. We are. We made a deal, and yeah. we should be doing this. You you got issues, we won't yeah. bring them up, and and so uh, that didn't happen. He did this, and I talked the guys into going out, and then they came out, and the conga drummer left, the timbali player left, the manager left, the road manager left, and I was left being a road manager for this, which I didn't know anything about, you know, just give me the B3. I didn't know what, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the B3 a little bit later. Um, so, so that, is that when, is that when things fell apart? Obviously the wheels fell off the, the Santana Roadshow. And um, is that what, is that what happened there? Yeah. It's, um, the car lost in. So yeah. we actually played in Madison Square Garden with no percussion. And <laughs> And I found I yeah. found a, a conga player, and took him backstage. You know, can you play a wawa coke? Can you you know what can you do? I and he turned out to be really good, and he ended up playing with us and it, it, to the the next step, which was Caravan Sarai, which I had already quit. 
I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll right. do one last album. That's what I said. Yeah. And then from there, so you went to, uh, did you form Journey with Neil? Well, I was up, I first went into the music, the music, went into the restaurant business with my dad up in Seattle, Washington. Right. Yeah. I'll never do it again. Working <laughs> with my dad was great. The restaurant business, oh yeah. my God. I went from the pan. Very different to the music business, oh, right? Yeah, I made music business like child's play. You, you, you yeah. think about it, in, in a restaurant business, you've got to have at least a thousand percent of uh, capacity that want to come back. Nobody's going to come to your restaurant every night. And so if you have 400 yeah. seats, you better have 4,000 people. Yeah. And try and build yeah. that, right? And there's a lot of stealing of food and booze. And it's just, man, it's a cash business. It's scary stuff. So yeah. uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't recommend it at all. So you formed Journey with Neil. Um, where does that take you from there? Well, the way, let's see. I was in Seattle and Herbie, the manager, Herbie Herbert, who just passed away recently. Um, right. Uh, but he still managed the band for, for until he passed away? Uh, no. No. Oh. Okay. But anyway, he, he uh, those two guys called me up. What are you doing? I said, I'm working on a restaurant. I didn't think I'd play music again, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. I was, really? Yeah, I didn't think so. You were that you were that sort of discouraged. I just, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I'll, I'll do this. I'll try the restaurant. Business. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah. yeah. But it was Herbie, and Herbie was Herbie worked with Santana as the stage manager, the truck driver, the equipment guy. He built he built uh, the. Uh, um, the amplifiers, he did so many things. And, and so he, uh, I, I've known him forever and I'm, I love him. And then he and Neil started this band up and they gave me a call. And so I came, came back to California. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. We'll be right back straight after this ad break. Hi, this is Joe Avati. And I am very proud to say that I am now one of the brand ambassadors for Elite Supplements. One of the supplements I take every day is Resveratrol, an anti-aging supplement. You know how they say that one glass a day of wine is good for you? It's because it's got resveratrol in it. But do you know how much wine you actually have to drink to get any benefit of it? 11 liters. Now it doesn't take Einstein to figure out that if you're drinking 11 liters of wine a day, you ain't gonna be around long enough to see any benefit. So make sure you get your supplements from Elite Supplements, Resveratrol. Worked for me. Look how young I look. <laughs> and I'm 73. Hi everyone, I'd like to thank one of the sponsors of the podcast, St. Romeo, who provide great skincare products for men. I'm going to show you some of the products. St. Romeo Facial Cleanser, Rock and Roll Face Scrub. And if you had a rock and roll lifestyle, you're going to need a face scrub. This is their deep cleansing charcoal bar. How putting charcoal on your face cleans it, I've no idea, but it works. This is one of my favorites, the cucumber eye gel. <laughs> Must be for vegans. And they've got heaps of stuff for your hair too. Shampoos, styling creams, and um, stronghold for your hair. <laughs> Obviously, I don't need any of these. I'd like to thank St. Romeo for being one of the sponsors for the Joe Vardy podcast. So tell me more about your time in Journey. Um, I'll, I'll put it this way. Santana was like a phenomenon. I mean, I mean we happened pretty yep. rapidly. Getting the mm -hmm. thing exploded. And, and Journey was built. Journey was a right. long process of building and um, it first was, when they first called me up, they were putting something together to, uh, they called the Golden Gate Rhythm Section and it would be a, 
a band to play for artists that would come to San Francisco and needed a band and we would be it. That's what they told me, but we were writing songs right. and it, I mean, it was going to be a band. Um, yeah. And so that's what happened. We were looking for a drummer and uh, went through several drummers to get it. Uh, Prairie Prince was the first guy, but he was with the tubes and didn't want to leave. And so um, then we found Ainsley and uh, and he became the drummer for, for Journey. And we just wrote a lot of songs, and 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 it, at first it was just the four of us: it was Neil, Ainsley, me, and Ross. And it, well, actually, yeah. George Tickner was a, another guitar player on the first album, but it turned into the four of us. Yeah. And then uh, Columbia at the time we put out three albums, and. They told Herbie, you got to get a, a lead singer. Neil goes, I thought we had one, you know, but they wanted somebody <laughs> out in front. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, that was fine with me. I, don't, I didn't mind at all. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, you know, then we went looking for singers. And first was Robert Fleischman. And, uh, and that didn't work out. And and then uh, Steve Perry. Perry, Herbie had heard, he, he's told this story a lot. He, he had heard about this guy, Steve Perry, through Columbia, through other people, and somebody else handed him a tape. Hey, this singer is going to be really good. He goes, you're going to tell me it's Steve Perry, aren't you? And he, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And if, right from the get-go, Herbie wanted Steve Perry to be the singer. And, and we had Robert sitting there and wanted to, to move that. And, uh, and so that happened. I mean, it just did. And, yeah. and Perry became the singer. And the first song that he wrote with Neil, where it was really apparent this was going to be something, was Patiently. Uh, it's on the Infinity yeah. album. It was a beautiful song. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that's what was going to go. I mean, Wheel in the Sky was written partially by Robert Fleischman. And uh, the Anytime and Feeling That Way, they had several writers. I was in on those two. And um, you know, just, we, uh, yeah. At any rate, they started writing. The Lights was written by, by Perry, and right. and Neil grabbed a hold of it and changed a few things. So they wrote that song. Anyway, yeah. that's how that all started to take off, and um, and it, it, it we were writing songs now for singing. I'd never done that. Santana was we wrote songs and we sang on them, but we didn't write right. them for vocalists necessarily. Mm -hmm wasn't the same kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, this became, you know, harmonies. Well, that's a very interesting distinction, isn't it? I, I didn't I didn't realize that you know, that's the way it went. Yeah, know? it's like um it just took a life of its own and we said now we're writing songs that I I've never done this. It was like a complete opposite from what I used to do with Santana. As, as far as the yeah. style of music and everything, it was just totally different. And uh, uh, I, okay, let's do it. And it just developed more and more and more and all that stuff. I just, you know, by the time 1980 came around, um, I was pretty through. I wanted to start a family and, yeah. and, and get off the road. I built two bands, building two bands, yeah. and been on the road for 14 years or whatever it was. I just didn't, didn't want to do that anymore. And, I, and the other yeah. thing was like, you know, 33 or something. I, I, it's funny now. I, mm. You know, wiggling my butt in, in front of a 15-year-old I thought was kind of rank. I was wrong. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. right. <laughs> I was just wrong about it. I thought, you know, that would be over with. And, uh, and it wasn't. It isn't. Here I am still doing this. You know, it just is. 
Yeah. Because there was a bit of controversy, you know, people uh, were saying that you left the band for other reasons. But that wasn't the case, was it? You just wanted to start a family. You wanted to settle down. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, life on the road. I've, how many gigs were you doing at the time? Like, you know, how many gigs a year? How long were you away for? Give us an idea about that. Sort of paint a picture of what it would have been like back in those days touring. No, I, I mean, with big bands. It was really simple. I have heard so many stories that told me why I did it, why I quit. None of them yeah. were true. You know, mm -hmm. oh, he did it because uh, Steve Perry's a singer now and he's not the same. I said, man, I welcome this guy yeah. coming in. I was playing <laughs> three or four keyboards, a harmonica, and singing leads, and I, you know, I was taxed. And yeah. uh, so this was great. And, and plus, he had a great voice. So let's do this. I have no problem with it. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's how that took hold. And so when, when I left, I just really had enough. And I was not, I wasn't doing anything good for them. They were doing nothing for me. I was just, mm. I was just fed up. I didn't want to do it anymore. And, yeah. You know, the yeah. gypsy life is really cool when you want to do it. It's great. Well, you don't want to do it yeah. anymore. It's, it's not fun. And that's kind of where yeah, it's at. taxing. It's very taxing. Yeah, yeah. So then I yeah. go. And before we move on to the next part of um, of your your life, what was your relationship like with Steve Perry and Carlos Santana during that time? I mean, did you did you become estranged from Carlos and then become friends again, or and Steve same thing? That kind of what was that it like? kind of sums it all up. Yeah, we had, yeah, right. it, it it ended poorly, and. And mm. we would try and do things once in a while, but it just didn't have, you know, I liked playing music with him, but that was it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and How hard is that to maintain, though? Huh? How hard is it to, to be in a band touring when, you know, musically you get on really, really well, but personally you don't? It's, well, it becomes impossible. You know, it's like... Mm. Everybody's got to remember. Everybody's got a hand in things when they go awry. I'm no mm. angel here, you know. A lot of people say, "Well, if you, you know, you did the right thing." And I said, "Well, look, everybody had a hand in, in, in why I left." But the main reason, the main big reason, was I wanted to change my life, have a family, and, and get centered again. And yeah. and. Uh, and I did, and I got a great family. I'm playing with my son yeah. now, and it's like, you know, it's terrific. So, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about your time with Sean a little bit later. Uh, so what happens then? Where, what happens to Greg Rowley after he leaves Journey? Uh, for two years, I, I, I tinkled around on a piano, but I did not want to do anything. So I did. Mm. I had a couple yeah. of horses. But you had enough... You had enough um, enough money in the bank to sort of live life like that it was okay you didn't you weren't struggling you, you weren't forced to have to go out to work you could focus on the family yeah pretty much i mean you know yeah. well, there were times where it was a little more of a struggle but so, yeah so what so you know get yeah. through that too get through everything yeah. so <clears throat> anyway then uh, 1985, I put out a solo record, and that was the first time I ever, yeah. I ever had to run everything. I always was in a band that the bass player played bass, guitar player played mm -hmm. guitar, played keyboards, da da da, and it wasn't you had to think of everything. Uh, that was yeah. the first time I ever had to do that, and it was uh, challenging. It was different, and so it made the record in 1985 Craig Raleigh then I did Gringo after that and I got better at it and um, then it started uh, started my, I mean, we did The Storm that was that, mm -hmm. that was a good band it was kind of like a yeah. kind of like Journey with a little more meat on it and you're right that's all I can say it wasn't a lot of ballads and yeah like that, and the singer Kevin Chalfant could sing up in the trees and do all that stuff, and so that was, it was a pretty good band. And I just I went through I don't know many many things. Uh, Abraxas Pool with Neil Sean and and the 
all mm -hmm. the rest of the the guys from Santana, Mike Shreve, Carabello, Chupito, um, minus Carlos and minus David Brown, who had passed away. And we got Alfonso, yeah. John, Alfonso played. And, yeah. and that was short-lived. Critically acclaimed, though. I don't know. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> so they tried to revive it, didn't they? Like if, um, not long ago with the concerts at the Pacific Rim. Oh, that was, yeah, with, with Ringo, Pacific Rim, that story. Yeah. Yep. Um, the way that worked, we came, we went to New Zealand and Australia. We played like five, mm -hmm. five cities in Australia, you know, Melbourne. With Ringo? Huh? With Ringo? With Ringo, yeah. Yeah. And um, In Australia? In Australia. And mm -hmm. it was... Yeah, Perth, Auckland, Sydney, Melbourne. Uh, There's like five of them. I can't remember them all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you have a good time in Australia? Did you get a chance to see it at all? Did you get a chance to, yeah, to, to a, travel I around? I took a walk around a, a couple places and stuff, and, it, it, and yeah. I found it interesting. But what I really liked, the people were really nice, really great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. The, the, uh, the stage crew. Or terrific. Mm -hmm. one, one guy, I can't remember his name, but he was a big guy, and he lived out in the outback, right? He told yeah. me about his house and all this stuff. And he goes, yeah, this one pulled out this python <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the wall. I said, you pulled out a python. And it, yeah, like, <laughs> like it was no big deal, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 That sounds very Australian. I've never had a python yeah. on my wall, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, really friendly. I, it was really cool. I liked it. And then topography and all that stuff. New Zealand, too, I liked that. And then mm -hmm. we went on to Japan. Well, while we're doing this, I'm getting a call from Neil mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. doing Santana again. He's, he had been, he yeah. been talking to Carlos um, with the original band. What was left of the yep. original panel, which was kind of the same thing we did with the Braxis Pool. And yep. I said, well, well, I'll wait till I get home. Uh, you guys, they were following me. It was like uh, Journey was following that, or, or, or Santana was following Ringo on the Pacific yep. Room at the same time. And, and, yep. and so I was waiting until Carlos got back home, and I called him and said, so is this... Is this true? You want to do this? Because yeah, mm -hmm. I want to call it Santana Four, because the band stopped on Santana Three. I said, right. That's really accurate. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, sounds great. So we, yeah, that's what we did. But it was it was very short lived, though, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went out. We went and played. We went and played three shows. Um, and it was uh, Madison Square Garden, Allentown, all Coliseum, Allentown, and uh, the one in Connecticut, the uh, Indian. Anyway, yeah, Connecticut as well. And they, they were sold out. And it was with Journey. So mm -hmm. Santana 4 and Journey. Well, it turned out to be... Uh, those were the three dates. That was it. And Carlos and his manager just kind of pulled the plug on them. And but it went. They went nuts. Uh, people went crazy about it. And we, so why did they pull the plug on it? Are you allowed to tell us about that or not? I don't know. It's like, yeah. you know, I've got my theories about it. But the point is, right. that it right. didn't happen, and it should. Yeah. I, all we want. Mm. I told him. I told Carlos. You know, all we got to do is go out there for. 30 days and show these people we, we meant it. I'm not looking to start yeah. a band all over again. I don't think I'd want to. Yeah. So, but yeah. pay these people back. They've been they waiting to see this. And, and, and it was mm. obvious they went crazy for it. But it got called a promotional tour <laughs> instead of yeah. what it really was. And uh, guys, come on. It, it, yeah. All those people wouldn't have just shown up if it was just, they didn't care, so. And so you, you, we mentioned Ringo, so now you you play 
part of the um, Ringo Star and the All Star Band, and then that's where I first met you in Canada. Yeah, I think you guys were playing Casino Rama, and I was hanging out backstage, and um, we had dinner together, and uh, uh, that's where our kind of friendship started. And I, I, I remember. So, so just to explain to everybody who's listening, who's not sort of familiar with the the concept of it, to explain to us the the concept of of what Ringo's done there. I'll tell you how it started for me. It's like I had a call to do this. I've yep. never done this, right? And I told Mark Rivera, the sax player and the music director, and I said, you better, okay, but you better get this music to me in a hurry because I've never done this. So I'm sitting here, yeah. I'm playing Toto music, um, Todd Rundgren, and... Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Music, yeah, I, it, and and it's like I'd never never done that. I mean, it took me really a lot to try and learn this stuff because yeah. it had to be a yeah. little. More so just so just to step back, uh, sorry, Greg, to interrupt you. Just to step back, the the concept there was that Ringo put together a band yeah. where obviously he was he was the drummer and also singing on some of the songs, but the the concept was to get some of the best musicians. In the world from other bands and put them together so the the particular concert that i saw um you were playing keyboards steve lukather from toto was on guitar um i can't remember his name the but is it the bass player from mr mr yes. yeah yeah, yeah I, um skips me now shoot um, yeah so and and i can't remember who else was on there so basically ringo would put this this band together of some of the best musicians in the world and and you would play some Beatles songs, but you would also play some Santana songs because you were representing Santana and Journey. Uh, that you'd play some Mr. Mr. songs, you'd play Toto songs. So that's what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. So, so, so when you say that you had to get this music, it, it, it was music that you had never played because you weren't used to really doing that, were you? Yeah, and I've already explained to you. I learned a long time ago when I played with a band, yeah. William yeah. Penn, that I don't do this well. And so yeah, yeah. Uh, I got it. By the way, it's Richard Page as the bass player. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. What a singer. Anyway. I, I remember that night because I, cause I love those two, two, some of the songs that I love from Mr. Mr. And I was just there blown away at, at how it just sounded so, so good and, and, and so much like the original. Yeah, yeah, it did. It, did. it was, it was yeah. one of my favorite ones to play. Because of that, I, mean, yeah, I yeah. closed my eyes and I loved it. Mm. Um, mm. And that was one, one of those songs when I sat down to learn it, I don't know why, but my fingers went exactly where they were supposed to go. I don't, didn't even know the chords necessarily. I just started right. playing it and moving with the song and they were, almost all of it was correct. And I was like, where did that come from? And, and that's how I learned that song. Mm. Anyway, I'm, so yeah. I'm sitting there. With, I thought it would be the shortest gig I'd ever have in my life is to show up, yeah. show up in uh, in Niagara Falls and and be treated wonderfully and play and he'd go aisle or window. <laughs> I thought he might have <laughs> told me to take a hike. Seven years later, evidently yeah. I do. Play other people's music, yeah. And, yeah. But it was it was a struggle for me to get into it, and then and it was one of the, then afterwards, I can tell you I, because the Beatles got me into music. When I was yeah. young. I loved it. I never played it, but I loved their music. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, and to be playing with him, you know, I look around for a couple of years. I, I look around. I, I can't believe I'm sitting here. You got to be kidding me. Yeah. yeah, and I, it was it was really a trip, and a, one of the best experiences that I've ever had playing music. I really love playing yeah. with these guys. It was really yeah. I look forward to it all the time. Yeah, was that the first time that you had met Ringo? Had you met him in other other no, in other circles? Never met him. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. so when I go to that first rehearsal, I'm going, felt like Jackie Gleason. I'm on a I'm on a I'm on a you know, <laughs> and I turn around yeah. looking, there he is. Oh my God, man. So I, yeah. so I try to break in and, and 
uh, tell them a story, but they were talking about the the Ed Sullivan show, which I did with Santana and Ed Sullivan. Yeah. And so I walked up and said, you guys were talking about, I, I actually played with it. It was a weird gig the way they did that. Mm. And, uh, mm. and told them the story about my dad watching, we used to watch Ed Sullivan all the time when I was a kid. Yeah. And, yep. and so here I am on Ed Sullivan, big as life, singing songs. And my dad's sitting there on the couch and he actually he kept getting closer and closer to the television. And he, he told me later, he goes, he fell. He fell on his knee. Like, <laughs> I can't believe this is my kid. I told Ringo that story. He goes, oh, drunk again. <laughs> I said, yeah, he's got a great sense of humor, not he? wasn't quick enough to go, so you met Dad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't. You can't yeah. get. I, I. I love his humor. Uh, him and yeah. Luke too. Uh, Luke just fractures me. Yeah. yeah. And so I, yeah. Anyway, I, I just love playing. We. It was a great time. We'd go out to dinner and uh, all the time. And it just. Yeah. It was so simple. All you, you got to do is show up, play yeah. good music with great people. And be yeah. treated well, stay in great hotels, and fly on a private plane. Oh, how, yeah. how horrible. Yeah, yeah how horrible. Yeah. That. Jeez, that sounds bad. <laughs> that sounds bad. And what did you learn from Ringo as, as a person or about touring? Because you said he, you did learn a lot from him, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I learned a lot of um, human things. I don't really pay attention mm. to him. And mm -hmm. he's just a good man. He's a yeah. really good man, and you know, what he does, he, he, I asked him also, why, this is early on, that first day, so why are you doing this? I mean, you know, mm. there's a lot of, he goes, I want to do it since I was 13, what else would I do? Yeah. And, and that's sure. it, and he, he loves the band, and he, uh, he was always checking in on everybody and make sure you know, the mm -hmm. boy's good, everybody like, like yeah. what's going on. How yeah. could you miss yeah. For me, it was like, yeah. don't ask me anymore. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great. Yeah. And are you guys still touring now? Will there be any more yeah, shows coming up? what happened is, uh, you know, the, call it a pandemic, I, I refuse yeah. I refuse to. Um, mm. I disagree with all that. I, I, I pretty much, I, I told him, I said, look, I put enough illicit stuff in my body. I don't need a government to tell me I need to take some drug <laughs> that they don't know what it is, right? And there's stuff on the internet and places that uh, I, I saw that. It's just I'm I'm not doing this. I can't do this. Yeah. And everybody mm -hmm. was taking getting that vaccine and all that stuff. And I said I'm sorry. I, mm -hmm. I love playing with you guys, but. This really mm. changed everything. It's not the music, it's not the guys, mm. none of that. I enjoyed it. Yeah. But I was not going to do that. And, there, and the, uh, the producer, Dave Hardy, he goes, I understand, but I'm going to have to replace you. I said, yeah, I know this phone call was coming, but uh, mm. it, it, it is what it is. And so I didn't go out with him. Mm. And uh, that was kind of it. Um, but... Hey, seven great years. It was like longer than I've been in any band, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tell us about, there's a couple more things that I want to, I want to talk to you about. Tell us about what you're doing now and, um, and what you're doing with your son, Sean. It's, uh, it's a band called New Soul, and it's S-O-L as in son. S-O-L, I was yeah, going to say, yep. yep. As in the son. A new son, and I found out that Soul is also Swedish for sun. I'm half Swedish. I didn't know that. So it's Swedish for what? For the sun. Soul. S O L. All right. Swedish, so, yes. Besides Spanish. Anyway, so we started this band up, but it's like really I got asked to join this by my son and Yayo Sanchez, the guitar player. Yeah. And now, just, just there is a backstory about. Yaya Sanchez, tell us about that, because that's very interesting. About him, him getting up with Dave Grohl, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us about that. Well, we, we knew Yaya, Sean knew Yaya before all of that happened, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Yaya painted his face up like uh, a Kiss guy and yeah. stood there with a sign, Monkey Wrench, I want to play Monkey Wrench. 
and Dave Grohl, yep. <laughs> come on up here. And so he got up there and yep. played, played Monkey Wrench, and and he got to be known as Kiss Guy, and yep. and Dave Grohl was blown away with him. He's, he's talked about it later. He goes, he might have been one of the best rock guitar players I've I've ever seen. He he blew it away. Yep. He really he took it over. Yep. And, yep. Uh, yeah. And and Yago said. I don't even remember it. He was so blown away. <laughs> it's the same thing. He's kind of blown away that I am yeah. Dave Grohl. Are you kidding? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and he got to be known as Kiss Guy. And pretty soon, I've heard that Dave Grohl, during a Foo Fighters show, people were coming and painting their faces like Kiss. And he paid. Yeah. That, because uh, that, 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 that video went viral, right? Oh, it went yeah, viral. What's your name, Kiss Guy? So it went viral. Right. Um, but you know, you just you just you just uh, made an interesting point there. How um, he said that he can't remember it because it was you know here he is playing with Dave Grohl, and you said you went through the same thing when you were playing with Ringo yeah. Starr. But do you think that Ringo? Also, kind of felt that. No. Sitting there playing the drums, looking at you guys, going, "Well, I'm playing with Greg Rowley." Maybe Rolly. later. You know, this guy. Uh, you know, maybe later when I talked to him and doing Oyo Como Ba, uh, we were going, yeah. we were going to South America, and I, uh, yeah. you know, it was not my place, and I, so I told Mark Rivera, I said, you know, instead of everybody's everything, which Ringo loved playing, um, yeah. Yeah. from the third album, Santana out. I said, we're going to South America. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, Oye Como Va is Spanish, yeah. and mm -hmm. why not? So yeah. uh, Rivera said, we'll ask him. And so I did. I said, well, I could, I've got this idea if you want. He, actually, he came up yeah. to me and goes, I've heard you've got an idea. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and... And I presented that to him, and he just looked at me and goes, done. Great. How cool is that? Yeah. 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 And I said, all yeah. right. And then Oye Como Va, and then we started playing that. And he, he, he goes, yeah. I love playing this song. And who? Yeah. He, he, later on, he said uh, in interviews, he goes, Greg Raleigh got me playing this Latin stuff. I'm Mr. Pop. What is, <laughs> you know, we yeah. love doing it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was fun. Yeah. That, that was so going back to the project that you do with your son, um, the, yeah, the 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 cover of the of the was it the poster or the album is very interesting. Tell us about that. The because because you see the two young guys on either yeah, side yeah, of you, right? It, but you've actually got your, yeah, your back to it. I turn my back to it because yeah. Uh, uh, I see what you're getting at. I, the reason why we did that is I've done the other. I've gone out and done, you know, relied upon, I've sold close to, between the two bands, I don't know, close to the 60, 80 million records. Who counts? I mean, a lot. Yeah. And, and I've used that for myself, and it never worked. It's like, uh, yeah. you know, so I told him, I said, look, man, my face is probably the kiss of death. We shouldn't do that. So I turned my back on him <laughs> to, you know, let him get who yeah. it is. And, and everybody, yeah. as soon as they heard my voice, said, I know who this is. <laughs> yeah, the right. the yeah. idea was then think about it. And, and uh, so that's how we interjected that. But what I loved about doing this and still do is that they, it was their band, their idea. And they asked me to join it. And and I love this stuff that they come up with, the new stuff that you haven't even heard, um, yep. that nobody's heard is incredible and young sounding and a lot of guitar. It's beat. Yeah, I was. I wouldn't come up with when, this. So, yeah, when's that going to be released? As soon as we get a label. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, we got. We're still looking for all of that. I mean, and yeah. We, it's going to take time. It's a, a tough time. But do you find that in in these day and age with social media and so on, how how is it? How are you finding it? How you know? Because you've 
you've been in this business a very, very long time. You've seen a lot of things change. How, now that your son's involved and, you know, and, and he's pretty, you know, advanced tech, tech, yeah. technological, he's advanced tech-wise, um, and he's up to speed with all this kind of stuff. What are you seeing that's different? And what are you seeing that you like? What are you seeing that you don't like? What are you seeing that, that might draw a parallel to when you were starting? Um, because you did say before that back then, look, now you, you really need to have a profile. You have to have some runs on the board. You have a lot of followers before the record labels um, chase you up. But back then, you, you could just have a go. Yeah. yeah. But in, in a sense, today, by having your own YouTube channel, by putting something up on TikTok or on Instagram or on YouTube, you're... In a, in a way, it's kind of going back to the way that you started too. You, you're just having having a go and letting it get out there and be discovered. So, what are your thoughts on that, Greg? Well, one thing is that uh, you get on YouTube. I mean, you have to get on to all these things, and it costs a lot of money to do it right and all that stuff. And people, have, yeah. people have the ability now because it's all so quick. Everything is fast. Before, you had to drive somewhere, yeah. go see a band, and if you I want to see it, and, and if you liked them, then you would go see them again. But you had had to put some effort into it other than just looking at a screen. And so mm. it was totally different, and it had a, a different vibe to it. You couldn't, you couldn't see this band unless you went and saw them. Now it, it's right there. And even with MTV, what happened with all that is that MTV is great. You get these great videos, and then it, they go to see the band, and it's nothing like the video. And I think it kind of, <laughs> you know, it's not what I thought. I didn't think, you know, mm. the other way, it, it was built. You you went to see a band because mm. it, I went to go see Chuck Berry when I was young because I want I I heard his records. I want to see him. That was it. Yeah. yeah. I want to go see them. Yeah. And so it's it's different, and it. And it's quicker. It's like they're almost, they're almost like an A and R guy. They listen to yeah. they listen to about fifteen seconds of the song and I don't like it. You know, they're in or out. And and, and so it's uh, it's not as personal. It's not mm -hmm. and, and so it's a harder road to try and get that going. And, and there's a lot of people out there. And it's just putting stuff out, putting stuff out, and and um, and what catches on and what doesn't is really hard to. It's hard to say. I, I I'm kind of dumbfounded about the whole thing, but I know that it's a big chore to try and get it done. You got yeah. And to get to a label, you got to. What are your numbers on Instagram and Facebook and all this stuff? Yeah. I mean, it. That's a full time job to try and get that done. Where's the music? Yeah. You know, how do you do the yeah. music and that? It's yeah. pretty difficult. So yeah. it actually, I think, was there was more romance in it mm -hmm. when it was my time building something. Yeah. You, and it was yeah. like, it was difficult. You had to, but you had to, uh, you had to audition. Santana auditioned for the Avalon Ballroom. And the guy went, nah, I don't think so. He sat out there. I don't think so. You know, what are you doing? Conga drums and organ and guitar? You know, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what he does. Um, who's, who's the most interesting person you've ever played with who's well known? And then tell us someone who you've played with who's really not known, who really sort of flies under the radar, not so much in terms of musicians, I'm sure musicians, you know, but the general public. So who's the favorite person that you've played with that, or, or, or someone that, you've, that really stood out um, that you've played with who we all know and someone that, you don't, that okay, we don't know? Okay, I get you. Um, well, obviously, I, you know, uh, it, it would be Ringo. The, the, yeah. I mean, the, I, I was really blown away to do that. And uh, especially because of the story I told you about how I... How I I didn't know if I was going to ever be able to do this. I was quite nervous. And then playing with him and traveling with him, being with him, it's, it was tremendous. Really, really love this guy. He's like, uh, 
And if it wasn't for him and the Beatles, I might um, I might have ended up that architect. That would have been a bad thing. Well, thank God for Reno. Yeah. Thank God for Ringo. <laughs> yeah, and well, and buildings you know that would have fallen all over the place. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. and then I can't say he's not known, but uh, an, another guy that I played with when I got here to Austin that was totally different is Alan Haynes, he's a blues guitarist. And he played at um, uh, Antones for years, way back when, and part of the Antones band, and really good blues player. And I got him to play, I went and saw him uh, playing at Antones when I first moved here. and. Uh, he came up to me and he goes, you know, there's a B3 right over there. <laughs> you know, I said, yeah. Well, I got this song. Maybe you want to play it. Said, what key is it in? D minor. I said, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> one of my favorite keys to play because you, you can really yeah. whittle on it. It's yeah. good. And... So, so I got up there and played, and the B3, it was kind of halfway done, too. It was kind of reminded me of going to Africa. <laughs> Africa, yeah. It yeah. Kind of, but it, it sounded pretty good, and I, I had people coming up to me, you played this before, huh? You played one of these before? Yeah. You know, didn't know, really know who I was. And yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, I played. You should be playing yeah. one of yeah. these all the time. <laughs> I like, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, but cool. Alan, now I've got one one last question for you. Now you know you you you've survived in a business which you know is notorious for for you know chewing you up and spinning you out. What what in your opinion has been the quality that you've had? Uh, you know, what have you done to live your life, your best life, to keep on going and being here today? and always keeping your head above water. I think people would really love to hear that. Well, I've been underwater a couple of times, but the point, but truly to your point, it was quitting, starting a family and changing my life and, and realizing that part of my life again. And then it's like getting grounded and then you can go do things again. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that, was, that was kind of it, it's a lot, it's, I, I didn't know whether I was going to do this anymore or not, but every time somebody, it's like a, my son's always telling me, he goes, you're, uh, you just, you just say yes to the right things for some reason. You just somehow, mm -hmm. and, and it's true. And Herbie Herbert used to say, he goes, you have a charmed life, Greg, but you can't say so. If you say so, it'll destroy it. So yeah. I don't say so. I just feel fortunate, and 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 the and the you know the music's the easy part. It's the hang that's really tough. That's as you get older, man. It's about the hang. If you're playing with people you don't want to hang with. It's miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't do that, you know. And yeah. Ringo was a great example of this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. And truly, what it just this is a no-brainer. I even asked him, "Does anybody mess this up?" And they said, "Oh yeah." Said, what? All right. Well, Greg, thank you very much, mate. It's been an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to hang with you for the last hour or so. Yeah. I know we've been trying to do this for a long time, and I look forward to catching up with you when I'm in. Um, I'm touring America next year. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be doing shows in Austin, but definitely Austin, Texas is on the on the cards just to visit. Very cool. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to uh, catch up and hang out then. And uh, once again, thank you so so much, man. I really really appreciate. My pleasure, it. believe me. It's great. We'll see you again. Great. I'll see you again. You know. Thank. thank All right, brother. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Adios.